Praise the Lord, all you nations. Extol Him, all you peoples. For great is His love toward us, and the faithfulness of the Lord endures forever. Praise the Lord. Together, everybody, worthy are you, our Lord and God, to receive glory and honor and power. We humble ourselves before you. Enable us to listen to your word. Speak, for your servants are listening. Let's read our monthly verse for the month of November, 2 Corinthians 8-7. Since you excel in everything, in faith, in speech, in knowledge, in complete earnestness, and in the love we have kindled in you, see that you also excel in this grace of giving. 2 Corinthians 8-7. Since you excel in everything, in faith, in speech, in knowledge, in complete earnestness, and in the love we have kindled in you, See that you also excel in this grace of giving. For what do we pray in the sixth request? In the sixth request, and lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from the evil one, we pray that God would either keep us from being tempted to sin, or support and deliver us when we are tempted. For what do we pray in the sixth request? In the sixth request, and lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from the evil one, we pray that God would either keep us from being tempted to sin, or support and deliver us when we are tempted. Of 
will follow. I will listen. I will love you. All of my days.
as you are to worship Come just as you are Grace of God has reached for me and pulled me from a raging sea, and I am safe on this solid ground. The Lord is my salvation. I will not fear when darkness falls. Of the rising sun, the Lord is my salvation.
Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we thank you that your steadfast love never ceases and that your mercies are new every morning. Today we ask for a fresh outpouring of your mercy and may we begin to understand the depths of your love. May we remember that you have lavished your great love on us so that we should be called children of God. As we walk through these turbulent times, Let us walk as your children. Let us walk by faith in you and not by sight. Let us focus constantly on your unchanging nature. Let us walk with grace and mercy. As we walk through the depths of this valley, may we see you in the heights of your glory. And may we reflect that glory by being your eyes, ears, hands, and feet. Lord, we bring to you our feelings surrounding this pandemic and lay them before you. Please meet each and every one of us where we are and see us through. Better yet, calm the storm that is brewing all around the world. We thank you for all the blessings amidst this pandemic, our family, friends, our neighbors, and all those who have made UCCC the place that it is today. Be near to the brokenhearted and comfort those who grieve. We especially pray for those who have lost jobs, normalcy, and loved ones. Protect and sustain all the frontliners and the backliners. Pour your grace and mercy on those who are bearing heavy weights and burdens. Those who are fighting with illness or have lost loved ones. Those who are working long hours and those without work. Those who are lonely, fearful, or anxious, we ask for your healing and comforting touch. We also want to thank you in advance because we are assured that when the proper time comes, joy would definitely come in the morning after the heaviness of this pandemic. We thank you for the opportunity to listen to your word this morning. Transform us, correct us, and mature us. Realign our values and revive our passion. Enable us not just to listen to your word, but truly connect with your word, love your word, and apply your word. Speak to us through the sermon and enable us to be teachable to accept corrections. May our praise and worship this morning rise up to you as fragrant offerings through your son Jesus, and rightly so, because you deserve nothing less but only the best. In Jesus' name, Amen. Our sermon passage for this morning is found in the book of 1 Peter, chapter 3, verse 18 to 22. For Christ also suffered once for sins, the righteous for the unrighteous, to bring you to God. He was put to death in the body, but made alive in the spirit. After being made alive, he went and made proclamation to the imprisoned spirits, to those who were disobedient long ago when God waited patiently in the days of Noah while the ark was being built. In it, only a few people, eight in all, were saved through water. And this water symbolizes baptism that now saves you also. Not the removal of dirt from the body, but the pledge of clear conscience toward God. It saves you by the resurrection of Jesus Christ, who has gone into heaven and is at the right hand of God with angels, authorities, and powers in submission to Him. 
Good morning, beloved, and greetings from Cagayan de Oro City on the northern coast of the island of Mindanao. Linda and I made our move down here very smoothly. Our shipment and our car arrived safely, and we're settled in our house and ready to begin our ministry in Cagayan de Oro City. But today we want to continue our study in the book of 1 Peter, and so I'd like to invite you to open your Bibles to 1 Peter chapter 3. We're going to be looking at verses 18 to 22, and the title of this message is Suffer Now and Triumph Later. And as we're going to see, the Bible teaches that, like the Lord Jesus Christ, believers, uh, we very well may suffer in this life for following Jesus Christ, but later, when we are in glory with the Lord, we will be victorious and have a great triumph. And so let's begin by looking at the, the last verse that we looked at in our last message, and that is 1 Peter chapter 3, verse 17. It said, For it is better, if God should will it so, that you suffer for doing what is right, rather than for doing what is wrong. And so the believers that Peter is writing to, as we have seen, are suffering persecution. They're doing what is right, living righteously, following the Lord, giving testimony of their faith in the Lord Jesus, and they were suffering severe persecution because of it. And so Peter, encouraging them to continue faithfully serving the Lord, even while suffering, uh, wrote that sometimes it is God's will for believers to suffer in this life for doing what is good. Uh, later on in chapter 4 of First Peter, in verse 19, he writes, Therefore, let those who suffer according to the will of God entrust their souls to a faithful creator in doing what is right. And so Peter writes that uh, as believers, sometimes it is according to the will of God for us to suffer persecution for doing what is right. And what we need to do is to stay faithful and continue doing good regardless of the circumstances. And as I mentioned uh, earlier in our passage today, uh, Peter is going to write that our faithfulness in the midst of suffering persecution for doing what is right can be the context of our greatest triumph. And he is going to cite the suffering of the Lord Jesus Christ as an example for us. An example for us. Now, remember when Paul wrote to the Philippians uh, Paul writing to the Philippians about the humbling and the humiliation of the Lord Jesus Christ and leaving heaven and becoming man, and then his exaltation uh, after he willingly suffered at the cross. Let me read for you back in Philippians chapter 2, beginning at verse 5. It says this, Paul writing to the Philippian believers and says, Have this attitude in yourselves, which also was in Christ Jesus. Have the same mindset, the same attitude that Jesus had, who although he existed in the form of God, that was before the incarnation, he did not regard equality with God as a thing to be grasped, but he emptied himself, taking the form of a bondservant, and being made in the likeness of men, and found an appearance of a man, he humbled himself, by becoming obedient to the point of death, even death on a cross. So the Lord Jesus Christ humbled himself. He did what was right in the sight of God, and he suffered terribly because of it. In fact, he was crucified and died on the cross. Severe persecution. But then in verse 9, the Apostle Paul goes on to write this. Therefore also God highly exalted him and bestowed on him the name above every name that at the name of Jesus every knee should bow of those who are in heaven and on earth and under the earth and every tongue should confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. 
And so because Jesus humbled himself, because he endured suffering for doing what was right in this life, then when afterward, when he died, he rose from the grave, ascended into heaven, sat down at the right hand of the Father, he was exalted and had great victory and triumph. And so just as the Lord Jesus suffered in this life, but triumphed and was victorious in the next, the same is true for us as believers. Now, many of us uh, have not suffered real severe persecution in our lives, because of the country we live in, but we know that many of our brothers and sisters around the world are suffering horribly and terribly because of their faith in Christ. And we never know when suffering might come into our life uh, according to the will of God for doing what is good. Let me read for you what Jesus said in Matthew chapter 5. Uh, we studied this, uh, the Sermon on the Mount, but remember when he wrote uh, said these things in Matthew chapter 5, beginning at verse 10. He said, Blessed are those who have been persecuted for the sake of righteousness, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Persecuted now, later, the kingdom of heaven. Verse 11, Blessed are you when men cast insults at you and persecute you and say all kinds of evil against you falsely because of me. Rejoice and be glad, for your reward in heaven is great. For so they persecuted the prophets who were before you. So the Lord Jesus Christ told his disciples, Rejoice when you are persecuted and suffering for righteousness' sake. Now, even though it is not a joyful thing to endure, still we need to rejoice because we are blessed because our reward will be great in heaven. Again, suffer now, triumph, and be victorious later. And so the Lord Jesus Christ is our example, and he calls all believers to be ready uh, to suffer for his sake and for righteousness. Well, let's look at our passage now in 1 Peter chapter 3. We're going to be again looking at verses 18 to 22. So follow along as I read verse 18. It says this, For Christ also died for our sins once for all, the just for the unjust, in order that he might bring us to God, having been put to death in the flesh, but made alive in the spirit. Well, let's look at this verse uh, phrase by phrase. First, Peter writes, For Christ also died for our sins once for all. And you know, some uh, translations say that Christ suffered for our sins once for all. So he suffered his passion during Holy Week when he was beaten and crucified and died. And he died for our sins. And notice it says once uh, for all. And the reason why it points this out is because in the Old Testament, the Old Testament sin offerings uh, had to be repeated over and over and over again because it is impossible for the blood of bulls and goats to take away sin. Whereas Jesus, he died once the perfect final sacrifice for sin. Now, let me read for you in the book of Hebrews. The writer of the Hebrews explains this in Hebrews chapter 10, verses 10 to 14. It says, By this will, that's God's will, we have been sanctified through the offering of the body of Jesus Christ once for all. And every priest, this is referring to the Old Testament Levitical priests that were still operating in the temple at the time the book of Hebrews was written. It says every priest stands daily ministering, offering time after time the same sacrifices which can never take away sin. The same animal sacrifices, uh, sin offerings according to the Old Testament. It says, but he, the Lord Jesus, having offered one sacrifice for sins for all time, sat down at the right hand of God, waiting from that time on forward until his enemies are made a footstool for his feet. 
For by one offering he has perfected for all time those who are sanctified. So the Lord Jesus Christ, he did not come to offer sacrifice, but God the Father prepared a body for him so that he could be the perfect final sacrifice for sin. So Peter points this out to the believers, that Christ suffered. He suffered when he was here on earth, just like they were suffering. And he died for our sins once for all. And then he says this, the just for the unjust. And here he's referring to the substitutionary death of the Lord Jesus Christ in our place on the cross. The just for the unjust. This is what the Apostle Paul was writing about when he wrote to the Corinthians in 2 Corinthians chapter 5, verse 21. It says, He made him who knew no sin to be sin on our behalf, that we might become the righteousness of God in him. So Jesus, the just one, the righteous one, died in our place. We are the unjust and he died in our place. So the just for the unjust, the substitutionary death of Christ. And he did that, as Peter writes here, in order that he might bring us to God, in order to bring us to God, so that we can have forgiveness of sins and the gift of eternal life through putting our faith and trust in that death, burial, and bodily resurrection of the Lord Jesus Christ. And then at the end of there, verse 18, he says, Having been put to death in the flesh, but made alive in the spirit. Made alive in the spirit. Now, being put to death in the flesh refers to the crucifixion, that it was his human body that was crucified on the cross. He was put to death physically. However, he says, he was made alive in spirit. And so he died in the flesh, but he was alive in the spirit. That's why when Jesus uh, was dying on the cross, in Luke chapter 23, verse 46, it says, And Jesus, crying out with a loud voice, said, Father, into thy hand I commit my spirit. And having said this, he breathed his last. And so the Lord Jesus Christ was put to death in the flesh, but made alive in the spirit, in spirit, as he committed his spirit uh, to his heavenly Father. So now, when, as we come to verses 19 and 20, this is really a fascinating passage in the Word of God. And it's about something that Jesus apparently did in between his death and his bodily resurrection three days later. And uh, there's been a lot of things written about this passage. And so let's look at verses 19 and 20 and see what Peter writes. Now remember, at the end of verse 18, he was talking about being made alive in the spirit. So he's talking about in spirit. It says in verse 19, in which, meaning Christ in his spirit, because his body was in the, in the tomb. It says, in which also he went and made proclamation to the spirits now in prison. Wow. So Christ, in his spirit, went and made a proclamation to spirits now in prison. The word proclamation is the Greek word karuse which means to announce or to proclaim. Some translations say he preached to the spirits in prison. But now the question is, who are these spirits and what is this prison? Are these spirits spirits of men? Are they spirits of angels? And what is the prison uh, that these spirits are in? Now, Jesus went there in his spirit, and he apparently announced his victory uh, on the cross. And the key to understanding this passage is the word prison. It's the Greek word uh, Tartarus, which also is sometimes translated abyss or bottomless pit. 
And we have a story in the Gospels, one that most of you will know and recognize, the story of the, the Gadarene demoniac. Do you remember that? The demon, or the, the man that had a legion of demons inside of him. And when Jesus cast out the legion of demons, they went into the pigs, and the pigs went down and drowned in the Sea of Galilee. Well, in that story, when Jesus uh, came and he was confronted by this demon-possessed man uh, with all of these demons, let me read for you what it says in Luke chapter 8, verses 30 and 31. It says, And Jesus asked him, What is your name? And he said, Legion, for many demons had entered him. Now listen very carefully to verse 31. It says, and they were entreating him or begging him not to command them to depart into the abyss. Into the abyss. That is, again, Tartarus or the bottomless pit that Peter writes about in the passage that we're looking at today. So here we see that the abyss or this prison is inhabited by demons. Uh, demons that were cast into this bottomless pit uh, because of their sin and wickedness, which we'll look at in more detail in a moment. Uh, but these demons are still in this abyss, this bottomless pit, uh, this prison even today. I'm teaching through the book of Revelation in my Preach the Word Bible study on Facebook. And not too long ago, we looked at Revelation chapter 9. And we saw one of the judgments that God is going to put on this earth during the Great Tribulation in the second half of the Tribulation period. And let me read for you what it says in Revelation chapter 9, verses 1 to 3, because as we're going to see, these demons that are down in this abyss, this prison, are going to be released on earth to torment mankind for five months. Revelation chapter 9, beginning at verse 1. It says, And the fifth angel sounded, and I saw a star from heaven, which had fallen to the earth, and the key of the bottomless pit was given to him. All right, this, this uh, uh, star that fell is a he. Uh, it's most likely Satan himself. And he was given a key to the bottomless pit. Again, the abyss, the prison. It says, and he opened the bottomless pit, and smoke went out of the pit like the smoke of a great furnace. And the sun and the air were darkened by the smoke of the pit. And out of the smoke came forth locusts upon the earth, and power was given them as the scorpions have earth, have power on the earth. And so these demon locusts that are going to be released at this time are going to be tormenting those who take the mark of the beast the mark of the Antichrist, during the last three and a half years. And so when Peter writes in our passage today that in his spirit, the Lord Jesus went and made a proclamation to the spirits in prison, the spirits are demons and they are in the abyss, the bottomless pit. And as I mentioned, most likely his announcement was his victory over them, uh, through his death on the cross, um, which just took place earlier. Now, verse 20 of 1 Peter 3 tells us a little bit more about these demons that are in the bottomless pit, in the prison, that Jesus went and proclaimed his victory to. Look at verse 20. Speaking about these spirits who once were disobedient. All right, when were they disobedient? when the patience of God kept waiting in the days of Noah during the construction of the ark, in which a few, that is eight persons, were brought safely through the water. So now we see that these particular demons uh, that Jesus announces his victory over are in this prison because they were disobedient back in the times of Noah. And while the ark was being built, well, we're going to look at a few New Testament passages also that deal with this before we go back to Genesis chapter 6 
and look at the account itself. Over in 2 Peter, uh, Peter again refers to these demons that were disobedient back in the days of Noah. In 2 Peter chapter 2, verses 4 and 5, let me read it for you. It says, For if God did not spare the angels when they sinned, all right, when did these angels sin? But cast them into hell and committed them to pits of darkness, uh, reserved for judgment. Again, they were cast into the abyss, into the prison. Verse 5 says, And did not spare the ancient world, but preserved Noah, a preacher of righteousness, with seven others, when he brought a flood upon the earth of the, to the ungodly. And so again, in 2 Peter, it talks about uh, these angels, uh, actually demons that were disobedient. They sinned during the time of Noah. Uh, the little book of Jude also speaks about these angels, these demons that sinned back in those days. Let me read for you in the book of Jude, verses 6 and 7. It says, And angels who did not keep their own domain, they didn't stay in heaven where they belong, but abandoned their proper abode, he has kept in eternal bonds, under darkness for the judgment of the great day. Again, a reference to the abyss where these demons are bound. But notice what it says about these angels, these demons uh, who abandon their own abode. It says, verse 7, Just as Sodom and Gomorrah and the cities around them, since they in the same way as these indulged in gross immorality, in gross immorality and went after strange flesh are exhibited as an example in undergoing the punishment of eternal fire. So Jude tells us that these angels were involved in gross immorality and they went after strange flesh. Well, the only place in the Bible that this could possibly be is in Genesis chapter 6, the story of Noah and the flood. And let's go back and we will see in Genesis chapter 6 what this is referring to. In verses 1 and 2 of Genesis chapter 6, it says this, Now it came about when men began to multiply on the face of the land, and daughters were born to them, that the sons of God saw that the daughters of men were beautiful, and they took wives for themselves, whomever they chose. And so here it tells us that at this time, men began to multiply on the earth, and they had daughters, many daughters. But then it says this, that some of the sons of God, the sons of God, saw these daughters of men, and took them uh, in marriage. Now, who are these sons of God that took these daughters of men? Well, in the Old Testament, this phrase, sons of God, sometimes refers to angels. We see this, an example of this, in the book of Job. In Job chapter 38, in verses 4 to 7, when the Lord is rebuking Job and confronting Job for questioning God's wisdom and his uh, doings. It's a, the Lord speaking to Job says this, Job, where were you when I laid the foundation of the earth? Tell me if you have understanding. So he's talking about creation in Genesis chapter 1. He says, who set its measurements since you know, or who stretched the line on it? On what were its bases sunk? Or who laid its cornerstone? Of course, Job could not answer. He had no understanding at all of when God created the earth. But then he says this in verse 7. When he did this creation of the earth, it says, When the morning stars sang together, and all the sons of God shouted for joy. And so this is a reference of angels who were there at creation and shouted for joy when God 
created the earth. Now, beloved, let me put this uh, all together uh, for you and try to make it as clear as possible. Peter wrote that the Lord Jesus, in his spirit, went and preached or proclaimed his victory to the spirits in prison. From 2 Peter and Jude and Genesis 6, we see that these spirits that are in prison are demons. And they are in the abyss, this bottomless pit, because back in Genesis 6, in the time of Noah, they either took the form of men or they possessed uh, the bodies of men who were living at the time and took wives and committed gross immorality. They left their proper abode and sinned in the sight of God, and so God cast them into this bottomless pit. That's why I said this passage is so fascinating uh, as to what the Lord Jesus did in between his death and his bodily resurrection. And so going back, we see again in verse 20 that only eight people, Noah, his wife, his three sons, and their wives, they were brought safely through the water. That's the waters of the flood. And they were brought safely because they were in the ark. And so Peter is referring to water here that they were saved through. But now in verse 21, he writes this. And corresponding to that, baptism now saves you, not the removal of dirt from the flesh, but an appeal to God for a good conscience. And so just as Noah and his family were saved from the flood in the ark, they were saved through the water, Peter now says, in the same way we too are saved by baptism. Now he very quickly uh, explains that he's not talking about water baptism. We're not talk, uh, saved by uh, physical water baptism. He makes that point very clear when he says not the removal of dirt from the flesh. But what he's referring to here, being saved by baptism, the word baptism means immersion. And he is saying that we are saved when, when in immersion, when we are immersed into union with Christ. And our union with Christ does not come through water baptism. No, on the contrary, it comes through spirit baptism. Spirit baptism. Let me read for you in 1 Corinthians chapter 12, verse 13. It says, For by one Spirit we were all baptized into one body, whether Jews or Greeks, whether slaves or free, and we were all made to drink of one Spirit. So, beloved, the moment you put your faith and trust in Jesus Christ, were born again of the Holy Spirit, you were baptized in the Holy Spirit, and you are immersed into union with Christ. And that is when we are saved, not water baptism. And then he says at the end of this verse, but an appeal to God for a good conscience. You know, there's only one way that we can have a clear conscience in this life, and that comes through faith in the Lord Jesus Christ. A clear conscience can only come when we believe on the Lord Jesus Christ, and receive forgiveness of sins, the gift of eternal life. And so these two verses, verses uh, 19 and 20, very fascinating. And then in verse 21, uh, he points out that in the same way, uh, we are also saved through our being immersed into union uh, with Christ. Now the last uh, part, the end of verse 21 and verse 22, Peter closes off this section by writing this. It's through the resurrection of Jesus Christ. Now remember back in verse 18, we saw the suffering of Christ. He died, he suffered for our sins, right? But now we're going to see the triumph that comes, came later for the Lord Jesus Christ after he suffered in this life. It says, we are saved through the resurrection of Jesus Christ, who is at the right hand of God, and having gone into heaven, 
after angels and authorities and powers had been subjected to him. And so Jesus suffered for doing what was right. And he was crucified and he was put to death. But now we see the triumph the victory of Jesus in his bodily resurrection from the dead, his ascension into heaven, and his exaltation to the right hand of the Father. And all of this, of course, is in fulfillment of the Old Testament prophecies and what Peter is pointing out to the believers he's writing to and to you and me is that, beloved, in this life, we're going to suffer. It's been given unto us to believe on the Lord Jesus Christ, receive all the blessings, but also to suffer for his sake. Jesus rose from the grave. He ascended into heaven, sat down at the right hand of the Father, exalted, victorious, and all the demons and spirits were put in subjection to him. Subjection to him. So, beloved, what's the application for you and for me in this verse, in these verses today? Well, I think we find them over in 1 Corinthians chapter 15. And here the Apostle Paul is exhorting and encouraging uh, the Corinthians that we are victorious in the Lord Jesus Christ. And though we may suffer now and maybe suffer very severely, one day... We will be raised from the dead if we die before the Lord returns. And we will be victorious uh, and have triumph with the Lord. Let me read for you in 1 Corinthians chapter 15, verses 57 and 58. Paul writes, But thanks be to God, who gives us the victory through our Lord Jesus Christ. Remember, beloved, we have the victory we will be in glory eternally with the Lord. He says, Therefore, my beloved brethren, be steadfast, immovable, always abounding in the work of the Lord, knowing that your labor is not in vain in the Lord. Beloved, the work we do, the labor we do for the Lord Jesus Christ, any suffering that we endure in this life, Okay, it's not in vain. It's not for nothing. Because when the Lord comes to take us home, or when we go to be with him, the Lord will exalt us like he was exalted. He will make us victorious, and we will triumph over all things from this life. And so, beloved, be encouraged. Stay faithful. And remember, we may suffer now, but we will be triumphant later. If you are a regular member of UCC Church and you wish to give through bank deposit or bank transfer, here are our bank details. Kindly email deposit slip or transfer confirmation receipt to write to uccc at gmail.com. Let me repeat write to uccc at gmail.com UCC Church We have online Bible study via Zoom up every second and fourth Friday of the month Our speaker for next Sunday is Pastor Keith Ibrahim Thou livest, therefore give more life to me. Therefore speed me in the race. Therefore let me grow in grace. Therefore speed me in the race. Therefore let me grow in grace. Deepen all thy work, O Master. Strengthen every downward route, only do thou rise.
excitement faster, more and more thy pleasant fruit. Urge me, prune me, self abase, only let me grow in grace. Urge me, prune me, self abase, only We confess the mystery and wonder of God made flesh and rejoice in our great salvation through Jesus Christ our Lord. With the Father and the Holy Spirit, the Son created all things, sustains all things, and makes all things new. Truly God, He became truly man, two natures in one person. He was born of the Virgin Mary and lived among us, crucified, dead, and buried. He rose on the third day, ascended to heaven, and will come again in glory and judgment. For us, he kept the law, atoned for sin, and satisfied God's wrath. He took our filthy rags and gave us his righteous robe. He is our prophet, priest, and king. Building his church, interceding for us, and reigning over all things. Jesus Christ is Lord. We praise his holy name forever. Amen. Loving God, we thank you for hearing our prayers, for feeding us with your word, and for encouraging us this morning. And now, may the Lord bless you and keep you. May the Lord make his face shine upon you and be gracious to you. The Lord turn his face toward you and give you peace. In Jesus' name, receive God's blessing. Amen and amen. service ends here. Don't forget to answer the survey. We posted the links on the description below. God bless everybody.